Yeah, he got it, man. He's going. We're live. We're live. So uh, greetings. This is Walter Kirkland. Nice to meet you. On behalf of the 100 Black Men of America, we send our greetings. We also want to thank you on behalf of Tommy Deutsch, our chairman, Dr. Mark Alexandra. And I'm the co-lead for Healthcare 2.0 and the founding president of Prince George's County, Maryland. Hope you're having a wonderful evening. I got to give a big shout out to my compadre, Dr. Omar Danner, who really is the brainchild of this Healthcare 2.0. He'll be talking later. Um, so I want to thank him for all his leadership with the 100 Black Men of America. Today, what we're going to do, and I want to also thank Radio One, Andre Tillman, uh, for his leadership and putting this together. This has been a great journey. This has been a multi-year campaign where we're trying to get the word out to know your numbers. And, you know, Dr. Danner and myself, we say this all the time. What you measure is what you improve. You've got to understand the baseline, especially from an African-American perspective of what's happening with COVID. We are a year later. I think Dr. Dan and I saw this about a year ago. Things are getting better, but we're not out of the dock. And we have issues. We have to wear masks. They, you know, the CDC is saying, you don't need a mask now in certain situations. We are not out of the dark. We have to continue and be vigilant about this process. So what I wanna do, I wanna go a little round robin. We put together this final panel of some esteemed I'm going to say experts in this industry. So, Dr. Danner, please introduce yourself. And again, thank you for your leadership, Dr. Danner. Thank you for putting this together, Dr. Omar Danner. Little introduction, sir. Thank you, uh, Walter. And again, I want to thank the leadership for the 100 Black Men of America. I want to thank our friends at Pfizer, who have sponsors, as well as the Moral School of Medicine, the National COVID Resiliency Network and our partners at Radio One who've really been you know, outstanding, as you said. Walter, this has really been an uh, incredible journey uh, over this last year through the pandemic, mm -hmm. through the social unrest, and the many other challenges that we've experienced as a nation and as a world. But this hopefully is given something that may be considered a bright spot. And so I wanna thank my co-panelists, Dr. Griggs, and uh, Mr. Dave Dixon for being on with us today. And thank Dr. Alexander for his leadership in the Health and Wellness Committee for the 100 Black Men of America to want to make a difference, do something to kind of change the DNA and be open to the idea and concept of let's hit the reverse button on our healthcare system and create the next iteration. Let's be the agents of change that we talk about so I just want to thank the listening audience. Uh, I'll be real quick. Uh, my name is Omar Danner. I am the president and CEO for Danbar for Life. I am a professor of surgery and surgical critical care, but I'm also a member of the DCAP chapter of the 100 Black Men of America. And I'm glad to be here with these fine gentlemen today. So thank you. I look forward to an exciting uh, presentation today. Thank you, Dr. Danner. Uh, you're a rock star, brother. Let's continue to move this forward. Uh, before we go any further, we also got to thank Dr. Not Dr. Stanley Campbell. He's not a doctor, but I think he's a doctor, right, Omar? Uh, right. Dr. Stanley Campbell, who's very sophisticated, he kind of got us together with Mimi RX with Eagle Force. It's the persistent monitoring platform that we've been using with these devices. You've seen us do this before with these blood cuff devices and pulse ox and uh, contactless thermometers. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Campbell and Eagle Force for what you do. It's a it's a minority owned company here in the DMV. Thank you for being a part of this process of healthcare 2.0. Also want to thank the Morehouse School of Medicine and NCRN, NCRN and Pfizer. We mentioned that earlier. And of course, the 100 Black Men of America. That's uh, they pay the rent. They keep the lights on, so to speak. Let's move over to this. This man sitting next to the man sitting next to the man, Dr. Charles Griggs. Jigs, what's up, man? How you doing, brother? Eric, you I mean, Eric, Eric Griggs. Eric, I gotta stop drinking. Eric Griggs. We got another. We got another Griggs in our organization. So my bad. And my cousin, Eric Griggs. So, Eric, thank you for what you do. We have a little launch today. I hear you're gonna do some good stuff. So, Eric, tell us tell about what's going on with you, buddy. So we have a lot going on. Now, first of all, thank you. Uh, as always, Walter, it's always good to talk to you. Walter, it's yes, always sir. good to talk to you. Uh, and uh, I'll tell my cousin that you meant you uh, you ask about it. Charles. <laughs> that's, uh, I gotta stop uh, drinking that that rum and coke. Yeah. <laughs> no, my name uh, is Dr. Eric Griggs. I am the community medicine director at a system of FQHCs down here in well down there uh, in New Orleans. 
uh, uh, called Access Health Louisiana. I'm also the health educator for the local Fox affiliate, Fox 8, 8 News, chairman of the Health and Wellness Committee uh, locally for our local chapter of the 100 and uh, uh, privileged enough to be a part of the committee with Dr. Danner and uh, all our folks on uh, on that committee for the 100 Black Men National Health and Wellness Committee. Nice. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, let's let's keep this thing moving. As I always say, being from New York, uh, we have a another superstar on here, Mr. David Dixon. David, what's up, buddy? Hey, thank you, Walter, Dr. Daner, Dr. Griggs. I'm just uh, so honored to be on with you guys today um, to provide some great education to the public about uh, a number of topics. So my background, basically, you know, about 35 plus years in banking. That's a couple. Uh, that's a couple weeks. <laughs> yeah. yeah, been been there, and um, the president of um, the National Investor Relations Institute uh, for here in Washington D.C., Virginia, and Maryland okay. for the last six years, and um, but also been heavily involved for 25 years with uh, health and wellness. And so I've been fortunate to have been exposed to some of the top scientists in the world providing some great insights that I'd love to share today. So I look forward to that. Beautiful. Thank you, David. Appreciate you being available. So why don't we uh, just migrate to uh, Dr. Danner. He has an overview. Uh, Dr. Danner. Thank you, uh, Stanley. I mean, thank you, thank you, Walter, for that. I uh, would ask, hey, Dwayne, can you please uh, put up the slides? But I really want to, uh, again, thank everybody, thank the speakers for this opportunity uh, to be able to present with you today. And I want to thank the audience. Uh, really have had some troopers as we progressed through this town hall series. Uh, we didn't know when we started this how effective it was going to be being in this virtual world. So, you know, I want to even thank the people at StreamYard, at Zoom, and all the other tech guys who come together to really make the world still function, even in the midst of the pandemic. Today, what we want to talk to you guys about is the impact of COVID-19 on these chronic health conditions, which have made the outcomes of African-Americans compared to other, you know, uh, ethnic and racial groups so differently, so different. It's because of purported underlying diseases. We've talked about hypertension. We talked about diabetes and obesity. Today, we're going to talk about something that I think may be at the heart of all of these other conditions, and that is its effect on the heart. So cardiovascular disease, but not just talking about the disease. Don't talk about the problem. I like what Bishop Scale says. He says, if you're going to talk about the problem and give you a diagnosis, let's talk about a solution. So we're going to talk about health risk factor reduction. We're going to have, Dave's going to talk to us about nutrition and the point of, of nutrition in getting our body healthy. Uh, last point I'd like to make is that I am the chair for Healthcare 2.0. And it's been an honor serving this year during this pandemic, as well as being the chair for the COVID-19 Pandemic Action Group, which we're going to transition over to our esteemed Dr. Eric Griggs, who's a rock star in this area, and you're going to really enjoy his talk. Next slide. But before we move on, I just want to give a stark reminder. Before we celebrate, before we throw up the victory sign, I want to remind us that we're still in the midst of a pandemic. Today, we crossed over the 30 million, 33 million people being infected in America with over 588,000 deaths. This is still a serious problem. We've killed more people during this pandemic from this virus or the virus has at least than World War I and World War II combined. So we still have a common enemy, a common threat, and we have to bind together. And so what I'd like to do is transition this over to my uh, dear friend and colleague, brother, Dr. Eric Griggs, to talk about where are we, Dr. Griggs? What can we do? What do we need to be doing? What do we need to know to protect ourselves, to protect our family, our loved ones, as we continue to fight and move forward to get ourselves out of this pandemic? Dr. Griggs, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Danner. Thank you all for tuning in. And again, Walt, thank you 
for your graciousness in moderating. Uh, I know this will be, hopefully this won't be too confusing of a ride and I'll try to make it as enjoyable because the more we smile, the more receptive we are as oxytocin bursts in that. So if everyone can remember to look in their cameras every now and then we're all looking at each other and at least make me think that I'm making sense. Um, Dr. Dan, you hit on a great point. Uh, it's a great way to start. Uh, I do have a slide presentation and mind you, those will just serve as mile markers. But what I wanna talk about is uh, exactly what you said. We are at about our own 18 yard line. We hadn't even crossed half the, the <laughs> crossed the midfield yet. And uh, Dr. Danner and I had a conversation earlier. It's as if the world, everyone is doing the wave now. Hey, I can go out without my mask. Hey, I've been vaccinated. And since the very beginning of this, they said that the solution uh, for COVID-19 is gonna be multifactorial. Uh, we mentioned the first things we said, we want people to social distance. We want them to wear a mask. Um, and I want to wash their hands. And, you know, and most of all, the one that was implied was that we would have common sense and pay attention to things uh, as they are put in front of us. And unfortunately, last year in everyone's panic, we had everyone that had ever taken a science class, putting on a white coat and going on YouTube and talking about a friend that had a cousin that said had a friend that said you caught it if you looked out the window and touched your head. I mean, it just, it was crazy. So we'll touch on where we've come from and then we'll finish with where we are now. And I'll try to take a moment uh, to, uh, my colleague and I have put together a something, I'll, I'll just say a presentation in a different way that hopefully brings it to, to light. Dwayne, uh, can, can we get the slide started, please? So again, uh, my job is to talk about COVID, not to teach people to read. Uh, but the, the title of the presentation is uh, our, our Coronavirus Origins, Adjusting to our new normals and where we are now. Uh, next slide. Uh, I'm gonna set a stage with that again. Uh, when we, we talk about adjusting to our new normal, we're gonna talk about our mental state and the Kubler-Ross stages of grief, uh, how it relates to where we are. Uh, and I'm actually gonna really try to focus on, we all need to focus on our mental health during this, this phase. Uh, just to set, set the stage again, uh, I lost a friend of mine that I'd had since I was six. Uh, healthy. Uh, he committed suicide three weeks ago due to life's pressures that were compounded, of course, by uh, the present foundation. And I also found out a little over an hour ago that another friend of mine uh, who was healthy uh, is had COVID for 19 days, 11 days, and is being admitted to the hospital today. COVID-19, what do we know about it? We know the first thing that we know, uh, we didn't know when it first came out, was what did COVID stand for? It stood for coronavirus disease 19. It's actually, this is the second iteration of it, second time seeing this. SARS, it's called SARS-CoV-2. If everyone can remember the SARS epidemic, well, that was SARS-CoV-1. <gasps> Wait, do you mean that a family of the, uh, two, two, two cousins in the family of coronaviruses actually jumped in humans? And we've quasi seen this before? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, that's important because that leads to where we are now when it comes to vaccines. We know that the animal uh, uh, jumped from an animal, what's called an, an animal vector. Uh, viruses have one job, and that is to mutate and change clothes. We try to jump from one vector to the next so they can pass on their genetic mater uh, material. Next slide, please. What also we know, we know that the, <laughs> remember when this all first started and we said we want everyone to watch out for dry cough, fever, shortness of breath. Well, apparently uh, last spring when I thought uh, we had taken a field trip, our National Health and Wellness Committee had, and I just got back in town, allergy had started acting up uh, and I couldn't smell anything. I thought it was, thought it was hay fever. Uh, over the course of the last year, uh, right, actually, yeah, over the course of the last year, I had the antibody test. Come to find out I'd had COVID and not even known it. Uh, the reason I bring that up is when we were thinking of the terms, this is an ever evolving process. A lot of people ask the difference between uh, emergency use authorization and approval. Well, it's time. Uh, the longer they need longer time in, in emergency pandemic situations, we can issue an authorization that has been deemed safe, but we don't have longitudinal studies yet. Why? Because we don't have a magic wand to fast forward into the future. It takes time and we're learning new things every day. Uh, we do know that the, the incubation period uh, the, has we started with two to 14 days, started one to 14, it was two to 14 days. And now if you've been exposed, they're saying as little as 10. Uh, we do know that the mode of transmission is respiratory droplets from human to human. But the, here's the thing that we found out. Again, uh, talking with my colleague, it's something that we knew beforehand. I've never seen one size 
spit droplet come out of my mouth. <laughs> the droplets of saliva, saliva have all different sizes. Some of them are so small that they can get caught up in air currents. Those air currents can move around to other places in closed and poorly ventilated spaces and make other people sick. And now, because of time, we have the data to support it. Um, what do we know about prevention? Avoiding close contact. Uh, wearing a mask. Uh, we, I know that the, the data is saying not to wash your hands, but my grandma didn't raise me ever to tell nobody uh, to wash her hand, no matter what the CDC say. Your mama say wash your hands. Please keep washing your hands. As a consequence of just those alone, and I haven't said the word vaccine yet, as a consequence of just, just those alone, do you realize how little, how, how, well, I yeah, how, 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 how low the flu transmission were, were this past year. It was almost zero. Now, I, I was about to say it doesn't have anything to do with vaccines, but we've had more people get flu shots. I've never seen more people get flu shots than I had this past fall. So if you combine the flu shot vaccine with the, the, the behavioral modifications of wearing a mask and staying home when you're sick and staying away out of large crowds and washing your hands, hopefully we can get there with coronavirus. Next slide, please. So we'll do a quick myth versus fact. Uh, I can honestly tell you I've heard every myth potentially uh, that you could possibly hear. Uh, the new things, well, we, we, the, one of the myths that were, this is why they're dangerous. If you remember last year, uh, at the very beginning of this, we thought that African-Americans couldn't be affected by COVID because they would always in the barbershop say, oh, look what they're doing in Africa. I don't know nobody with it. Then less than a month, a few weeks later, in my home state of Louisiana, our governor had to come in come out and let everyone know that seven out of 10 bodies showing up at the morgue looked like us. Why? It was the Band-Aid was ripped off of the social determinants of health and inadequate access, but also, and that's the point of this, um, this, 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 this series and what we're talking about is the result of chronic disease in our communities. Um, we know that putting a hairdryer up your nose, won't, it won't give it to you. Uh, the, the vaccines are not putting microchips in your body. Um, every myth that you've heard, I can just just blanket statement. It's probably not true. And if you think it's true, I'll, you'll have your, my contact information to look it up to, just to confirm. Next slide, please. So what we're doing here today is the, the launch date. This is the world premiere of something I've been working on for the last four to five months, along concurrently with this, this, this pandemic, this global pandemic of coronavirus. We've had a literacy and a communication and a public health communication uh, 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 pandemic. So what I want to do is my, my colleague and I, who's an infectious disease doctor, came up with a simple way of explaining it to our kids. And hopefully we'll get the attention of the adults of how vaccines and uh, viruses work. Dwayne? I'm nervous like I'm in a movie theater right now. Hey, ho, let's go. I'm Dr. Mark Allendary, and I'm an infectious disease doctor and epidemiologist. And I'm Doc Griggs, and I'm a community health specialist. Speaking of special, today's podcast is coming live from inside the human body. So, Doc Griggs, does that make it a podcast? <laughs> Dude, don't make me regret sharing my space time hop trick with you. Thanks, TV sitcoms. So, these COVID-19 vaccines are super safe and effective, and thankfully, were developed quickly in response to the global pandemic. First, let's explain how the coronavirus makes us sick. Ooh, check out those spike proteins on the coronavirus. They help it burst through healthy cells, where it replicates inside, destroying the cells and making us sick. I really hate that dude. The vaccine will take care of him. Vaccines stimulate your immune system to fight viruses. Some of the COVID-19 vaccines work by delivering mRNA to your cells. Think of mRNA as instructions that activate the immune system. Let's check out a healthy cell to see how mRNA works. COVID-19 vaccines deliver a package loaded with millions of mRNA to your cells. Then the ribosomes read the genetic code on the mRNA like a manual and produce spike proteins that mimic the COVID-19 ones. That stimulates your immune system to make antibodies. Now, off to the lymph nodes. Here's where antibodies are created. The heroes that fight coronavirus. The spike proteins attach to the antibody, leaving an imprint of the spikes, basically setting a trap for the nasty coronavirus. When this part of the antibody attaches to these spike proteins on the coronavirus, it immobilizes the virus and stops it from infecting our cells and making us sick. 
if an actual coronavirus comes into the body, the antibodies are ready to rumble. Battle faster! That's why COVID-19 vaccines are essential for teaching your immune system how to fight off the coronavirus. And that's our show for the day. Ready to roll? I've got this. Dr. Griggs, that is amazing, Dr. Griggs. Way to go, Eric. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that helps to make it a little bit easier. Uh, that cartoon kind of tells us where we are now. We have three, three vaccines in our arsenal, two of which are mRNA vaccines, just like they were described. Uh, Pfizer happens to be one of them, one of the first ones to come out. We have tools in our bag. I want everyone to get vaccinated. I want them to wear their mask. And I want them to use common sense. If you have a question about how you should take protect yourself with this, call your mom or your grandma. They'll tell you exactly what to do. And of course, we'll be here. Uh, again, we need to take care of ourselves. And as always, I like to say, get checked, get fit, get moving, go to your doctor, eat healthy food and exercise. And uh, it'll, it'll save your body, your heart, your life and so, your family. So Eric, uh, you. Eric, man, where do you want to take this? This is educational. It's animation. Where do you want to take your videos? Uh, we want to take them everywhere possible. What we're looking to do, I don't know if you remember Schoolhouse Rock, but uh, I was yeah. a, I'm was i just a Bill, just a lonely old Bill. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, I would love to take it everywhere. Education world, uh, the, the media, anywhere that there's That's someone sad. needs to understand and have it animated. Uh, now that I'm in the animated world, anything's possible, right? Yes, it is in this virtual world. So just kudos to you and your team. And that's pretty exciting. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, let, let's keep this thing moving. Uh, Dr. Danner is going to come back and he's going to touch on some heart disease. Dr. Danner. You know, unmute yourself. Just unmute yourself there on the bottom. All right. Thank there you. There you go. Uh, yes. So Again, uh, kudos to uh, Dr. Griggs. I thought that was really awesome, awesome uh, video and auction cartoon to really kind of help us. Conjunction, mm -hmm. junction, what's your function? <laughs> so, all right, thanks. So again, uh, I want to thank you guys because I, I really think that now that we are starting to get the tools, we're starting to understand the tools, the vaccines, the different medicines and the t different technology that Walter uh, talked about, the digital blood pressure and oxygen monitors and the Mimi RX application. But now what I want to do is talk to you probably about the most critical thing, because once we end this pandemic, these things are still going to be around. Heart disease, can we have the next slide, actually kills more people in America, keep going to the next slide. Advance, 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 and keep on going till you get to my slides. But heart disease kills more people in America than any other single disease. And the bottom line is anything that kills Americans in general tends to impact us African Americans worse and other similarly vulnerable population, Native American, Indians, and you know Latino Americans. So we wanna talk about heart disease, hopefully increase your understanding of why heart disease is such a problem. Next slide. The, the big thing is, is that heart disease is a preventable health condition. I know that we think that, you know, once you get it, my granddaddy had it, my dad had it, so I'm gonna have this. But really and truly, heart disease and atherosclerotic disease, which is another fancy way of saying that you have stuff clogging up your blood vessels. Uh, if it's in the heart, it's called heart disease. If it's in the peripheral, it's called peripheral vascular disease. But these things are all interrelated. And they're tied to a lot of things. But one of the things that's tied to outside of just poor nutrition and improper imbalanced nutrition, physical inactivity became a major risk factor for heart disease in 1992. But these other health conditions, such as diabetes, hypertension, and obesity, are all interrelated and feed into this same process. It also leads to cerebral vascular disease, or diseases in the blood vessels of the head, which lead to stroke. So uh, what we want to do is talk about all these different things, and particularly, you know, these other things such as cancer, back pain, osteoporosis, and chronic lung disease, because they're all interrelated. Next slide. What I'd like to do is just explain for a second, how does atherosclerosis 
develop? How does atherosclerotic heart disease form? So when we eat in basically imbalanced food, high fat, high carbohydrate, low fiber, poor nutrient foods, and particularly in excess, it stores this energy, it's fat. Fat can be triglycerides, it can be cholesterol. We talked about that a little earlier, we'll talk about it a little later. But some of this cholesterol actually is a part of our cell wall lining. When we build it in excess, it can get stuck underneath the cell wall, the inner lining called the endothelium, and build up its, what's called a plaque. And this builds up inside of the arteries in a person's heart. It could be in the arteries outside the heart. It could be in the arteries that even go to the brain. But when it builds up into the heart, we call this heart disease. And the insides of the arteries begin to narrow, which lessens or blocks the flow of blood. In our last presentation, we talked about peripheral or gynecoid obesity versus central or android obesity. We said that central obesity was worse. Why? Because that same energy that's stored up around our waistlines is the same kind of fat and cholesterol that's stored in our blood vessels. And that's why central obesity is linked to heart disease. And people have this as a worse outcome because when these plaques form and they rupture or they burst or they break open, they can release this material into the bloodstream that causes blockages like a roadblock down the road. And so when the blood flows through there, it leads to a catastrophe. And so when you go and get your, uh, say, a heart, a, cart cat, a heart cat, sometimes the cardiologist will tell you that there, there's a narrowing. When it goes over a certain level, 60, 75%, this is these critical areas of stenosis, as we were pointing out earlier. And these areas prevent blood flow. So when you need more energy, when you're under stress, when you're out running around the track, the body said, I need you to pump more energy. So the heart is going to try to pump from the backside more blood through these blood vessels. It can't get through there. And so this leads to myocardial ischemia. I mean, you don't get enough blood, enough oxygen to those tissues. And this is what leads to what's called a heart attack. So when it does, this blood clot can form on the plaque and the blood flow basically is blocked. So when you have COVID, or when you have anything like some of the uh, vaccines, the issue has been clotting, activating platelet factor four. Platelets is what forms these plaques. So when you have something that causes this plaque and clots to build up in somebody who has heart disease, they can be at increased risk. So next slide. So just understanding that eating well and exercising and doing those things could ultimately clear those vessels reverse heart disease, this is the central take home from this, that this is a preventable condition, is a manageable condition, but you have to work with your doctor and your cardiologist. But I want you to first start with increasing your understanding. So that's what we hope to accomplish in this next kind of series of slides that we'll talk about. As I said earlier, heart disease is the leading cause of death for people of most racial and ethnic groups in the United States, including African Americans, American Indians, Asians, Hispanics and white men. One person dies every 36 seconds in the United States from cardiovascular disease and about 655,000 Americans die from heart disease each year. That's one in every four deaths are due to heart disease. So even after COVID-19, the 587,000 deaths that we've seen, we got to understand that more people die of heart disease in one year than even COVID-19. And it's still going to be a problem after this virus pandemic goes away. Next slide. In addition, the most common type of heart disease that's killing most people is called coronary artery disease. And this is when this these plaques are building up in the arteries that supply blood to the heart. There are about 18.2 million adults age 20 and older that has coronary artery disease. This is about 6.7% of our population. So this is a very common problem. And as people get older, this disease, this process can continue to advance and lead to further clogging of the arteries. And so as people get older, the risk of having a heart attack from coronary artery disease increases. However, about two in 10 deaths from coronary artery disease happen in adults less than 65, and it happens at an increased rate in African-American men less than 65. And this is why they have, we have 
uh, 10% shorter life expectancy than other similar groups of people in America, whether it's women or men. Next slide. In the United States, you know, someone has a heart attack, like I said, every 40 seconds or less. Every year, about 805 Americans have a heart attack, but about 600 plus thousand actually have it for the first time. So this means that 200,000 people have a heart attack that already have had this. So it actually serves as a risk factor for a future heart attack. About one in five heart attacks are silent. Just like you can have silent uh, COVID-19 and not know about it, you can have a silent heart attack. But the damage is done, but the person is not aware of it. So if you don't monitor, if you don't measure, you could have these conditions that happen and actually have the sequelae, the consequence, even a second heart attack, which is like a second hit hypothesis. The second event is worse because there's already pre-existing -pre underlying damage. And therefore, it makes this heart condition worse. And if you have enough destruction of heart, heart tissue, you can have what's called congestive heart failure. Next slide. These things, again, are made worse by COVID-19. COVID-19 showed that we had serious kinks in our way of delivering healthcare. So Healthcare 2.0 was created so that we can start looking at critically the way that we deliver health and the management of disease in our country, in the westernized world, and start looking at ways that we can reverse it by empowering individuals to start self-monitoring. And so, again, we want to give a special thanks to Mr. Campbell for introducing us to this technology and, de and delivering it through Eagle Force, through iHealth, and even companies like Apple who are working on this biometric monitoring. But just understand this, that heart disease is, again, if you look at the percentage of African-Americans that die from this each year is 23% versus the Caucasian population is 23.7. We make up a much smaller population of citizens in America, but let, yet we represent such a high rate of disease. The same thing with American Indians and Asians. So there's demonstrates what we call a disparity and there's room for improvement. So how do we do this? by learning and understanding our numbers, knowing what to do about it. So we want to talk about in this presentation, what are some things we can do to reduce our risk of heart disease and make it possible to overcome this? Next slide. One of the things we can do is understand, again, our BMI. As the BMI goes up, as you get more central obesity, fat around our waist, it increases your risk for heart disease. If eating right, exercising, aerobic exercise, burning that excess energy off, that excess fat off, decrease your risk of having heart, heart disease, diabetes, hypertension. All these things are interrelated. Next slide. When all these things come together, it forms a condition we talked about last time called central metabolic syndrome. This is also known as insulin resistance or prediabetes. This is associated with hypertension, dyslipidemia, heart disease. Next slide. When your blood pressure is elevated, this puts more stress on the organ systems, the kidneys. It puts more stress on the heart. It must puts more stress on the brain and sets you up for actually even having a stroke. One of the things is we're starting to find that even blood pressures at 120 to 130 is an early form or early warning sign for elevations in blood pressure. Remember the days when you're young and healthy and fit and your blood pressure was 110 over 70. As the arteries get, as you get older, the arteries get stiffer, the heart gets a little uh bigger and starts working a little harder that blood pressure tends to go up so learning to understand not only how to measure but what do these numbers mean and what do i need to do about this to basically prevent my risk of having a bad outcome next slide the other thing you need to know about is triglycerides and fat we're going to talk about fat uh or, or what we call health risk factor reduction but understand that dyslipidemia is equal to high triglycerides, high cholesterol. That means a triglyceride level over 130. If you get a lipid panel or a cholesterol level over 200, understand that these are abnormal. A high HDL is actually good. A low HDL, high density lipoprotein, is bad. So when your HDL, which is protective, is less than 40, it puts you at increased risk for developing heart disease and a heart attack. Next slide. 
when all these things come together, just understand that there's a strong association with the development of cardiovascular disease and increase your risk of heart attack. Next slide. So if we lose weight and we start basically taking better care of ourselves, then we have a decreased risk of having these worse outcomes due to COVID because obesity, central metabolic syndrome, atherosclerosis is linked to four out of the top 10 causes of death, heart disease, cancer, cerebrovascular disease, and diabetes. Next slide. And so as we continue to process this, just understand that people who are diabetic have a little sugar. They have a 75% chance of dying due to heart disease and a 15% chance of dying due to stroke. For every 1% rise in your hemoglobin A1C, the risk of diabetes-related death increases by 21%. So when your level starts going over 6, 6.5, understand that that's way too high and really trying to get it below 5.5 puts you at a higher safety margin. Next slide. And just understand what these numbers mean because heart disease due to smoking, obesity, poor diet, and activity is the leading cause of preventable death in America, more so than alcohol, infectious disease, firearms combined. Next slide. Next slide. But the good news is most of these deaths and diseases related to obesity are treatable and or preventable with proper nutrition, increased fitness, effective weight loss, and sustained weight control. So next, what we're going to do is we're going to have our friend, uh, Mr. Dave Dixon, talk to us a little bit, Dave, about nutrition and how it actually has an effect. I actually, in addition to being a critical care specialist, I'm a bariatric surgeon. And what I learned as a bariatric surgeon is that obesity is really a treatable condition with the proper nutrition, with exercise, with the proper assistance. So can you share some knowledge on things that can be done to actually help right. us improve our health during this pandemic? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Danner. But Dave, before you come on, we have a quick question because I always like to make these things interactive and versus just presenting. Um, Dwayne, can you display that question, please? All right. Who would like to take that? Um, uh, they're speaking of, and Sean, thank you for your question. Uh, maybe Dr. Griggs, you can take that. On the recent CDC guidelines for wearing uh, a mask, what do you think are the repercussions, Dr. Griggs? And should we wear a mask, not wear a mask? Dr. Griggs. So, so my answer is, uh, you should. We should always wear a mask. Uh, I'm going to be wearing a mask for quite a while. Uh, it's a personal decision. Uh, we encourage. Our job is to tell everyone the truth and give everyone the science. Uh, these are still. We're, we're in a free country. People make their own decisions based on their own belief systems. We know that the vaccines are working and our numbers are going down. We've known for a long time. Prior to us knowing that, all we had was masking, social distancing, and washing our hands. I call it the trifecta. I don't see a, a reason for that to stop. Um, th th I, I can't pick one that I wouldn't want in my bag. Like Dr. Danner, I'm sure you wouldn't be able to pick an instrument that you'd like to not have if you're doing surgery. Um, we need all of them. So the recommendation uh, to wear masks, we're still in a state of, of discovery, right? Uh, we're still finding out new things. There is data out that says uh, that people uh, that get vaccinated, uh, if you're looking at the, the numbers, uh, it looks like the numbers are going down, like in our seniors and in, in our senior centers. We have data supporting all of that, but we also have data. We went through all that to get people to wear a mask and went, did all these studies and we, we, we had the graphics, we did everything to show how protective it was. I don't want until we know something definite that we can a way that we can prevent this. I don't want to take any tools away that we have to protect ourselves. So I, I trust that the CDC based their recommendation on 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 sound evidence, but it is just a recommendation. Uh, my family and I, we're wearing a mask and I would recommend you do the most that you can to protect yourself. So let's say that. Let's stay there for a second, and maybe uh, Dr. Dana can respond to this. Dr. Dana, after you get vaccinated, how long does that last? Is it a is it a, depends on your immune system? Is it six months? Is it a year? Do you need yeah. a booster shot? Can you reply to that, Dr. Yeah. Dana? Yeah, I think that yeah. that's a great you question. Light you just oh, change the light this is on this whole national broadcast. Hey, here, can, can, can we uh, mute that light off? Okay, let's mute Dr. Griggs. Dr. Griggs, let's mute him. Thank you. Mute Dr. Griggs. Go ahead, Dr. Dana. Yeah. You're responding. So, yes, uh, the first thing is it depends on the type of vaccine that you received. Okay. And Dr. Griggs said that there were three types. There's the 
mRNA subunit vaccine, Pfizer, Moderna. There is the adenovirus viral vector vaccines by Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca. And then there's another one coming out by Nova, Novavax, which is a protein subunit. Okay. That's still in study, so we can't speak to that at all right now. But for the mRNA vaccines, to the best of our knowledge, the Pfizer CEO, he did come out recently and say that uh, if you're taking the mRNA vaccine, you're probably going to need a booster. Some people have already even had boosters, but in about six months. With the Johnson & Johnson, to the best of our knowledge, an adenovirus or a viral vector vaccine activates T-cell immunity, so you have a longer-lasting effect, and those last probably a year to the best of our knowledge right now. So for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine or viral-type vaccines like the flu, that's why we have an annual flu shot, measles, mumps. Some of those others may last a little longer, but the like Johnson & Johnson vaccine will probably be equivalent to the annual flu shot, to the best of our understanding, six months for the mRNA two-shot vaccines would be my my best answer. Thank you, Dr. Danner. Uh, Dr. Griggs, just as a follow-up, do you think this is a way of life now? Do you think we're going to have to have this annual, like we have our flu shots, and you think we're going to have boosters? Uh, I absolutely do. Uh, I think it's, and it's something that we can get accustomed to. And I think thinking of it in terms of a flu shot helps a lot of people. Uh, the, the studies yeah. are out now. They're looking to combine. They're looking at all different combinations. Uh, potential, uh, you know, like you have your measles, mumps, rubella. Uh, imagine uh, if we had an influenza COVID vaccine every year. So, of course, that, of course, and I got to go back to it while wearing a mask, right? Yes. Yes. Thank you. All right. So uh, good questions. Keep them coming, everybody, please. Uh, all right. Mr. Dixon, the man sitting next to the man, sitting next to the man, sitting next to the man. Mr. Dixon, how are you, sir? <laughs> Unmute yourself. Yeah, unmute yourself. You're muted. Just unmute yourself. There you Thank go. Thank you, Walter. Sure. Tell All us right, about uh, tell us about nutrition, fitness, and uh, self monitoring and achieving this great wellness. This guy looks like he's 16 years old. So tell us how to do it. Yeah, man. I'm 65, but um, I've done some great things. My wife and I, and a lot of folks. But uh, it all started with really listening to the science and following the science and the, some of the greatest science that's out here for us. Could you flip the, uh, the slide for me, please? Next. Okay, so uh, basically around 90% of Americans are uh, have some form of deficiency. We just don't know it, but people are deficient in something. Lithium could be a deficiency and create some real mental you know, issues for people, right? Um, so there is an epidemic of uh, deficiencies in our country and around the world, and a lot of people aren't aware. So for example, certain vitamins and key compounds are really critical to fill the gap. You'll hear Dr. Danner talk about this stuff all the time. He and I talk a lot, and Dr. Griggs. So basically, there's a gap. The foundation is your, it's like your home, is built on a foundation, all homes, right? So you need to fill this gap and get rid of these deficiencies that you have in your body. Eating healthy is not good enough. It's really what you absorb. It's not what you eat, but eating is important. So we need to focus on, on those, uh, those things. Next slide, please. So to achieve optimum health, okay? You have the medical side, you're talking about all the cardiovascular issues, you're talking about you know, the coronavirus, you're talking about a lot of things that affect humans. Well, here you need to sleep and get your rest at night. Okay. You really need to focus on, you know, your spiritual well-being, doing yoga, meditation or something, just some quiet time. It's good for the body. Uh, while you sleep at night, you're healing. Okay. Healthy relationships are really good. So I think you have to focus on those things. Um, so there's a lot of things that go into being, you know, at that optimum health level. So it's really important for folks to focus on that. The eating, the supplementation, I think is key. Proper hydration, drinking water, uh, not a lot of these uh, sugary drinks because it'll affect your hypoglycemic condition. And you heard what Dr. Dana had to say about diabetes. So it's really important to have all that and moderate exercise, go for a long walk. It's all important things. Next slide, please. 
So there's some key facts. I won't touch on a lot of these, but just basically, you know, 80% of our health is accounted for in our gut. And a lot has to do with the stomach. Obesity is a major issue, as you heard from Dr. Dana and, and, and uh, Dr. Griggs. So blacks are disproportionately affected by many of these diseases that I won't go over, but they've all been laid out for you in the earlier part of the session. Um, our immune system resides in our digestive ecosystem. So what you put in is very important. And inflammation is key to the body. Too much inflammation is not good. It leads to serious health issues. Next slide, please. So additional facts, a leaky gut. You don't want to have a leaky gut because then you can be looking at, you know, diseases like diabetes, uh, certain types of cancers, hypertension, diverticulitis. Um, it's not a good thing. So the foods you eat, the vegetables, the fruits, you know, it's better, the fiber better than a lot of processed foods. So visceral fat, that's what Dr. Daner touched on, that fat around the waist. It's all over the body. It's around the heart. So you might not see it, but it's intrinsic. So you need to keep that in mind as you look at your outside of your body, look in the mirror, you've got to get rid of visceral fat and build muscle mass. Um, protein is good for tissue repair. Excess sugar in your diet, it's not good. Okay, it's really not good. That simple sugar, you know, it, it, it tends to uh, be in processed food. The carbohydrates you heard Dr. Daner talk about, it's not complex carbohydrates. These are simple. It's like taking a cup of sugar and just drinking it. Not good. Next. So key compounds like iron chelate, for example. These are some key things that the body needs. The chelate, iron chelate. Why chelation is a bonding of that that iron that allows it to get into the body organically much better. So absorption, it's not, you're not what you eat, you're what you absorb. Always remember that. So biglycinate is a really high quality uh, uh, iron that is, uh, promotes, you know, increased absorption and, and uh, hemoglobin oxygen transfer, transfer. Vitamin D, Dr. Danner talks about it a lot. Vitamin D is very critical. It's a synthesis, it's a hormone, from the sun, that's your number one source. But in addition, for those people that don't get enough because we're at the 35, 35th parallel above you know, Chicago, you need to get some vitamin D in your system. So you need to supplement. It helps to pro provide you know, healthy bone structure, skin improvement and immune function. So there's, there's iron and vitamin D, for example, it's vitamin D in shiitake mushroom, which is very good for you. Vitamin C and zinc. I think Dr. Danner touched on zinc relative to virus. Sodium absorbate, which is the highest quality of vitamin C and zinc that's out there. So you need to have that in your in your regimen because it will help to mitigate based on some studies that were done, even uh, certain viruses. Next slide. So vitamin B12, vitamin E, choline, great for the brain. Neurotransmitter helps to, you know, in the brain and liver especially for women, coenzyme Q10. A lot of people are familiar with that. It's a fat soluble nutrient, good for the heart. So these are great, you know, great, great things for the body. Next. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so leading up to all this science, right? There is the blue zones all around the world, and I've listed them here for you. So Okinawa, Japan, Peru, Alaska, parts of the Mediterranean, and parts of France. These regions were key to go for the scientists to look into why these human beings are living so such long and healthy lives. So it's really important to understand that a lot of the science, and there's one science out there called the age lock science, is really looking at the uh, gene expressions in human bodies and how these compounds the nutrients, macro, micro, all doing a great job to give you that boost in your immune system. So not to take anything away from vaccines, but let's say you still need a regimen to give your body what is needed in addition to Western science. Um, so the nutritional piece is very, very important. Next. So how do you measure? So you can take all this stuff in your body, but you got to measure it. Most people say, hey, I don't know how to measure it. Well, you got a blood test. You have a urinalysis with your physician, right? But in addition to that, now there's a photon wavelength measurement of apparatus called the S3 biophotonic scanner, the only one in the world. Uh, here's a picture of it at the bottom of the screen. But this machine can measure carotenoids in the body. These carotenoids are linked to antioxidants. Antioxidants 
are really good for the body because they have um, extra pair of electron that they give to what are called free radicals. Free radicals okay. up our healthy cells every day. David, David uh, we have a question about the guts. Can you display that, Dwayne? And hold, hold that thought for a second because okay, you're getting thanks. a lot of nice comments there, David. Uh, people thanks, are kind of chiming in. Uh, if you could display that. There it is. Are there any specific supplements that we could take to help with our gut health, uh, David? Yes, um, I know of one leading edge scientific stuff going on right now. It's coming out in the fourth quarter of this year. It's called the Meta. Meta will be out. It's the most sophisticated supplement ever put together for gut health. It's coming out. I just don't have, I'm going to meet with the company in July, uh, my wife and I and some leaders. But once this is available, we will share. But it's called Meta. It's the first supplement of its kind for gut health. It's how do you really spell really that, how do you spell that David? M-E-T-H-A. M-E-T-H-A. Thank you. Uh, I think we have another one here. Uh, Pop, put it up there. There we go. Can you explain more than what you mean by it's not what you eat, but what you absorb? Don't we absorb nutrition from our food? Are you speaking about vitamin and materials, and minerals in the food? Yes, yes. Um, when you eat when you eat food and you have minerals, trace minerals present, it kicks into biology from high school. It's the Krebs cycle. So basically, you get energy from that. There are times when uh, the body does not uh, readily pick up um, nutrients. For example, if you put a piece of ore in your body, that's iron that's shaved off of a piece of metal in your body, you will get constipated. It'll, it will just get to the stomach and it may not get to the mitochondria in the cell where you need it. So you need that, that uh, you know, vegan friendly type of, um, of compounds that are going to get there. But you also need the chelation. There are facilitators in the body um, that are compounds that facilitate great absorption. So chelation is one uh, when you wrap it with amino acid. It's a very expensive process, but you wrap that piece of ore with amino acid and it takes it into the cell because the body likes protein. Once it sees that protein and amino acid, it grabs it, it opens it up. When it gets to the mitochondria, hello, oh my goodness, it's iron. So I'm here. I'm here. Rel I'm here. Relative to anemia that a lot of people of color trouble with anemia, you need to have good iron in the body. So there is some iron out there that is very safe and is good for the body, um, but it's not a piece of ore. It's uh, organic and not inorganic. Okay, proceed. All right, so the biophotonic scanner is cool. You check it out, it was on Dr. Oz, and it measures your carotenoids. It takes 30 seconds just in the palm of your hand, and it measures that. That's the only machine in the world that can measure your, your uh, antioxidant status and level, and that's has a direct correlation to your immune system. So remember that. Next slide, please. So some important tips here for you. Um, the bioavailability is very important. Absorption, again, is very important of nutrients, you know, um, that are important to the body because you take in some supplements that you see out there in the stores, you bring them into your body, but guess what? You make expensive urine. It never gets to the cell where it's needed. So most people don't understand this. Uh, antioxidants can neutralize unstable free radicals. I touched on that uh, recently. And then, you know, when you purchase nutritional products, you must make sure that they're based on proven scientific research, clinical studies that have been done, blind studies with placebo, as well as the compounds. And what effect does it have on your cognitive ability? What effect does it have on your energy? What effect is it having on your body? As you look at, again, the foundation, getting rid of the deficiencies that we don't really know what they are. They're in our bodies. We're deficient at something. Allergy season, many things, people. But once you get this foundation of nutrients through supplementation and proper eating, exercise, diet, and sleep, then you can build from that point and figure out you know, what, what to do. Next slide. And in summary, um, it really comes down to you know, proven science and clinical research, which has been done. So that's where I've focused a lot of my energy, my wife, uh, Terry, over the last 25 years. So a healthy uh, foundation is critical. The health facts are real and troubling relative to the 90% of us that are deficient in something. It's an epidemic. Um, you talk about high quality compounds and the absorption is very important. So not all vitamins or supplements are the same. You have to understand that. That is an educational piece. It's not the same. You, you will get certain compounds. You get 85% absorption into your body in the cells where you need it. Because again, you're making cells minute by minute. 
and some of the other supplements just make expensive urine, which you don't want to do. Blue zones, critical research. If you haven't, go out and look and do your own due diligence and research on it. But the 6S process is also very important. When they make a product for you, just like the pharmaceuticals like Pfizer, it is critical that they have efficacy. That's the first. And in addition, there's a 6S process where they have to make sure that the manufacturing process starts with the sourcing. Where do I source the ingredients from? The selection of those ingredients are very important. The safety of those ingredients for human consumption is important. The specification is important. The standardization and substantiation. This is you know, what the pharmaceuticals have to deal with through the FDA before they put anything in your body. And the same thing should apply for anything you put in your body relative to supplements. Measuring the immune status is critical. Your, your um, scanner score is very important because of the carotenoids. You can Google it, look up carotenoids and its relationship to antioxidants, which are great for human beings, come from green, dark green vegetables and fruits. Very good for you. And the biophotonic scanner is the only machine to our knowledge that is non-invasive that can measure that correct in your body and give you an antioxidant status. Thank you. Thank you, David. We have another question. Display it to Wayne, please, and then we'll transition. Uh, there's the question, can you highlight some of the detrimental ingredients in processed foods? Oh boy, this must be a good response here, David. <laughs> Corn syrup and gluten. What's your response? Yeah. yeah. So so the, the the substances tend to get to your to your spleen. The spleen is is sort of a, a place where processing happens in the body. So when you really look at you know processed foods, it's what it, it is, processed foods. So refined sugars. The white sugar that you see, granulated sugars, those kind of sugars are processed and the body doesn't really recognize a lot of man-made compounds like man-made sweeteners, things like that. Um, you know, when you look at stevia, it's from a plant. Stevia is now the trend where if you watch what's happening in the beverage industry, a lot of folks are going there. At Whole Foods, there's green cola. Green cola is stevia-based it is replacing the Coca-Cola that people drank that triggered that diabetes and a lot of things in people. So the, the preservatives are also something that you have to focus on. The preservatives will create havoc in the body and doesn't let the normal process happen the way it should. So the simple sugars, the simple carbohydrates. Remember, when you eat a potato, a lot of things, these pastas, you're getting sugar. It's like taking a cup of sugar and drinking it. You're not getting a lot of nutrients. So the dark fruits, the collard greens, the spinach, you know, those vegetables, um, corinda, Dr. Danner talked about turmeric. It's a natural uh, anti-inflammatory food uh, spice. You talk about ginger, which is good for the stomach. There's a lot of things that you can have in your diet that's good for you and some fiber um, as well. So processed food, you got to be careful. Get that out of your, your, your system. All right, we got one more one more question, then we're going to transition over to Dr. Danner. Uh, he says, "Dinner time is Central Times. What are the three most important things you should have on your plate tonight?" <laughs> Thank you, George Daniels. Yes, and I, I so, guess it's not fried chicken, is it? <laughs> no, 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 no. So what you want to do is the palm. Use your hand as a as a guide. There In the go. middle of your hand, you should have um, a lot of vegetables in your hand. Okay, the first thing you go to the salad bar. You get load up on that first mm. because those polyphenols and bioflavonoids that are there are powerful for the body. OK, so you load up on a salad. Then you look at your plate and you have a little bit of carbohydrates. Carb is not bad, but get the complex carbohydrate like that Jamaican yellow yam. Right. That stuff will stay. If you eat a piece in the morning, you're not going to be mm. hungry for a while because mm. it's a complex carbohydrate. Then you get a piece of. Um, of, of meat, lean meat, like mm -hmm. chicken or fish on your plate. And again, the portions are important. Caloric intake, don't get that plate that looks like a mound and you're sitting down there <laughs> and you're 65 year old. Come on, you can't do that. The body, yeah. caloric, there's been studies done to show limit the amount of calories you bring in, yeah. exercise and go for a walk, do that and get your rest at night and drink a lot of water, fluids, so that you're not dehydrated. Great responses. So we're going to transition on the top of the hour. Uh, man, we could go on and on and on. Uh, you get a lot of comments there, uh, David. So uh, let's transition back over to uh, the Dynamo, uh, Mr. Omar Danner. He's going to talk about some health risk factors reduction. Dr. Danner. 
Oh, what's with the sound? Uh, no, thank oh, you, uh, thank you, Walter. Thank you, Dave, yeah. for uh, a wonderful talk and you know, again, yeah. outstanding uh, perspective. And uh, again, I want to really commend you because now it starts to shape the idea that there's something mm -hmm. that we can do. If we focus on nutrition and learn more about nutrition, there are things that we can actually do to improve our overall health. I like what you said about you are what you eat, but you are what you absorb. There are good quality foods. There are bad quality foods. There are good nutrients. There are bad quality nutrients. Absorption is very key. If it doesn't make it into your body's bloodstream and into your system, it doesn't have an effect. So actually quality does count. And that's why basically most things are what you actually pay for. So just think about that as you're making your decision between eating vegetables or the expensive McDonald's or Burger King meal. I like it myself, but in moderation, you have to understand that anything in excess is bad for you. One of my favorite scriptures says, let your moderation be known. So we're going to talk about these health risk factors and understand how moderation and how these choices are really going to influence. So next slide, Dwayne. So what we want to do in this segment is talk about health risk factors, fat and cholesterol reduction strategies. Next slide. And in this segment, what we want to do is we're going to define what health risk factors are. We're going to explain the role of these lipoproteins, this cholesterol business, understand what that lipid panel actually means, and then review systemic versus dietary cholesterol as well as dietary fats. And then we're going to at the end discuss and build on what Dave talked about, discuss prevention and intervention strategies. Next slide. So the real question is, why do some people seem to stay healthy? And why do other people get sick and die prematurely? We have lost a lot of people during this pandemic. And a lot of them probably did not need to transition as early as they did. So again, I take a moment of silence for those people that we've lost, anybody who's lost a loved one, and just kind of pause for one second in their remembrance. Thank you. But for those of us who are in this listening audience who are at the sound of my voice, this is not the time to drop our guards, lay down our hats and die. This is the time that we need to really take heed, listen to what is being shared. Because one of my favorite revelations is, you know, there's an old cliche saying in our community and most communities of the world, knowledge is power, knowledge is power. Well, actually, I'm actually a, a non-believer in that. Uh, commonly stated phrase or quote, application of knowledge is power. It's not what you know. It's what you do with what you know. It's what you do with this information is what's really going to count. And it won't make a difference if you don't actually take it in, apply it, and really get the benefits from it. Next slide. So what we want to do is talk about what are some of the reasons that people die. These are basically due to health risk factors. These are things that affect your health that you probably if you knew about, would avoid if you knew it actually had a direct impact. But groups, the government, the National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute have looked at these factors that affect our health and lead to worst outcome. And they can be roughly grouped into four categories. Some have seven, some have 27. There are different ways to reconstitute this. So to all our public health folks, hey, we know that there are different ways to look at this. But the four major buckets are lifestyle. Those are things that we do. Heredity and genetics environment, and the inability to access optimal care or a lack of medical treatment. With the Affordable Care Act, it actually gave us access to health care for most Americans, for an increased population, increased se segment, not all. But the thing is, when you start looking at these risk factors, if you look at lifestyle, 50% of the reasons that we get sick in America are due to our weight of living, our habits. 20% is due to genetics. I like 20% are due to environment. And in fact, one of the things I talked to one of my brothers here, KT, uh, Ken Turner here in Atlanta, and one of the things we talked about was some of this genetic stuff can be influenced and basically that number can be reduced. How do you do this? Kukua would like this through aerobic exercise. Walter is a Olympic senior marathon runner. Dave is also a track athlete, but also through nutrition, through proper nutrition, you can change the equation. But moderation is, is the key, depending on what it is you're talking about. Certain things you need in appropriate quantities, but things that are not good for you, whether it's 
simple sugars, whether it's uh, even smoking. You shouldn't smoke at all. If you do smoke, smoking in moderation, I say you shouldn't smoke. So, But the bottom line is anything you do in excess, alcohol, drinking a beer, I'm not anti anybody choosing to use their adult you know, rights. But doing it in excess with alcohol can lead to these bad outcomes. But just understand that you have a control, have some control. Next slide. So the real question is, what is a risk factor? We hear people talk about this all the time, but a risk factor is any individual or environmental condition or activity which predicts the absence, presence of future development of a given medical condition. It may be a medical condition itself, as we talked about, diabetes, hypertension, obesity. It may be a lifestyle behavior, such as smoking, such as excess alcohol, such as driving 95 miles per hour in a 55 mile per hour zone. Or it might be a environmental condition. Out in California, around Oakland, there's sites that actually have been affected by previous radiation exposure and testing from years ago. There are other sites that may have chemicals being dumped in plants. If you're exposed to those chemicals, it may put you at increased risk. Certain types, some people believe electrical lines, high power, like electrical lines and transducers may induce brain cancer in certain people. So if you understand that this thing, this place has increased risk, then it's your job to make the right decision to not basically go put yourself into that environment. One of my second favorite sayings in disbunking another myth, they say life is about choices. Well, I actually don't believe that one either. Actually, in my opinion, life is about consequences. It's about the results. It's about the outcome. Choosing the outcome you want basically will dictate the choices that you can make. And so once you start choosing health as an outcome, you'll understand medical risk factors and that these things can be reduced if you know where they are. So what is the medical risk factors? There's increased cholesterol, increased blood sugar, increased triglycerides. Understanding what those labs mean when you get your lipid panel or your chem profile, it becomes important. Knowing what your hemoglobin A1C is and what does it mean and what can you do to reduce it. Understanding blood pressure. Increased blood pressure is a risk factor. One of the things that stimulated us with this Healthcare 2.0 initiative was showing up to the meeting with a lot of our members having elevated blood pressure to a point where some even require additional medical attention. And the question was, well, when was the last time we measured? Three months, six months, nine months, 12 months ago. This is not the best way to basically take care of your health. So when you look at data and you look at continuous data every day versus episodic data, one time here, one time three months ago, one time six months ago, the question is, which set of data can actually help the doctor, help your provider, help you make the best decision for you? And is that data that's measured more frequently? And so by you starting to measure, you can improve up on these numbers, including your body weight. So when your BMI, your body weight is high, we measure and translate this into a body mass index. When it's, go, when it's over 25 or 25 or greater at least, it's considered to be overweight. And when it's over 30, it's considered to be obesity. But when the percentage of body fat is elevated over 25%, it's also obesity. So, Walter, you can be skinny and you can be obese at the same time. And this is why thin people can die of heart attacks as well. Wow. Next slide. Mm -hmm. So, with relates to lifestyle behavior, again, these are things like smoking. But also, there's crimes of omission, meaning I didn't do it. It's a sedentary lifestyle. In 1992, as I said earlier, obesity. Sedentary lifestyle, lack of physical activity became a risk factor for heart attack and heart disease. And then, as Dave talked about dietary habits, high fat, low fiber. So what, can, what does this have to do with absorption? Well, if you go and you have a high fat diet with low fiber, you're going to absorb this high fat, high sugar content, but you may not get enough fiber, which helps the processing of food through your digestive system. It also helps regulate the cholesterol. And so people have a higher High fiber, low fat diet tend to have a better cholesterol or lipid profile. Next slide. In addition, as, a, as we put all these things together, one of the key things that you need to know, that 86% of the reasons that Americans die prematurely are modifiable lifestyle or health related issues, healthcare access, behaviors, and even our environment. We can do things about this. Only 14% is related to non-lifestyle related causes of death. And so even with COVID-19, you have to understand that if you optimize yourself 
It gives you the best chance at actually preventing disease. I am a trauma surgeon. I'm a critical care specialist. I'm a bariatric surgeon, a general surgeon, all formal training. We operate on things like appendicitis and gunshot wounds and car accidents. But these are end organ damage. These are things that are actually preventable. And we don't want to basically wait till these things happen. So an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. The same thing with coronavirus. We don't want to wait and basically be on the other side of the equation and treat these kind of very life-threatening conditions. We want to be on the preventive side. So in addition to doing the things that Dr. Griggs talked about, wearing your mask, hand hygiene, practicing social distancing in high-risk environments, there's something called secondary prevention and preventative maintenance, focusing on optimizing your body, your immune health by taking things like vitamin D, getting your level at your doctor above 30, taking zinc, taking zinc to slow down the viral replication, taking a multivitamin to fill these micronutrient deficiencies. But as somebody said, even a healthy balanced diet, green, yellow, red, have color on your plate, limiting the amount of meat, higher quality meats, fish and chicken three times to five times a week and limiting your red meat to two to three times a week. But practicing portion control. These kind of things will lead to improved health. If you understand these things, then a healthy outcome is a decision that you can make. Our, one of my other revelations is that, you know, all this damage is done outside the doctor's office. So what we can do in the span of 15 to 20 minutes is very limited. That doctor limit, doctor's visit is not as important if you're not doing the things that you can. So it's what you do outside the doctor's office and whether you're here to our medical advice and comply with the medications that you're supposed to be taking, this is the only thing that actually really impacts your health. Understand you're in control, you're in the driver's seat. Next slide. And we hope that this information will help you to understand that you can reduce your chance of a shorter life expectancy by understanding how to manage these risk factors. I'm going to talk about this last study real quickly, and we're going to finish up and transition and answer some of these questions that we have. But one of the things is there was a study we call it the Mr. Fit trial. It looked at individuals 16 over a 16 year period, males 35 to 57. There was another famous study by Dr. Herman Teller, a dear friend of mine called the Jackson Heart Study that looked at this in Jackson, Mississippi and African Americans, which is another study to go and review. Just look at the Jackson Heart Study and Dr. Herman Taylor. But the bottom line is that they showed in the Mr. Fit trial that when you have multiple risk factors, you have increased risk. So when you're obese, when you smoke, drink, when you drive fast, Eric, you could actually have a chance of injuring yourself and uh, you know maybe some bad happening. Next slide. So in this Mr. Fit trial, what they did was looked at coronary heart disease rate per 1,000. If a person has no risk factors that we'll talk about, they have a 1.6 times out of a thousand chance of having a coronary artery event, a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. If you have one risk factor, high blood pressure, smoking, or high cholesterol, you can have a seven out of a hundred, a seven out of a thousand times, which is about a four times higher risk of having a cardiovascular event. Next slide. But when you have two of these events, that number goes to 13. So when you have obesity and high blood pressure and you're a smoker or you have high cholesterol, or any of these combinations of high blood pressure and smoking or that a high blood pressure and high cholesterol, or even high cholesterol and a smoker, your chances go up to 13 from versus 1.6 percent, or 1.6 out of a thousand. And if you have three of these risk factors, then this risk increases to 21 uh, times out of a thousand, a 1300 percent higher risk of having a coronary artery event, an acute heart attack, acute myocardial infarction, if you have multiple risk factors. So there's a lot of reasons for keeping your weight down or getting your weight down and optimizing your health. Next slide. But just to understand, a lot of people think a lack of exercise is, a high, is the greatest risk for a heart attack. This has been looked at. The most sensitive predictor of heart attack risk is your cholesterol, your LDL and that cholesterol panel. So ask your doctor what that lipid panel is. Ask him what it means. What can you do outside of just taking Crestor and Lipitor to get it down? There are other non-medication, non-therapeutic, pharmacologic therapeutic ways of actually reducing it. But if you can't, then taking that medication until you get it down and then ask your doctor to wean it off is actually critical. 
Cholesterol is influenced by your dietary habits, your physical activity, smoking, and genetics. Your LDL, your bad cholesterol, your triglycerides, and your very low density lipoproteins are influenced by diet, but your HDL is influenced by physical activity. Next slide. And so just understand there are two types of cholesterol. There's systemic cholesterol. So just so you understand what we're talking about, this is naturally produced in the body. Yes, your body does make cholesterol. All animals do. This is what makes our cells pliable versus like chloroplasts making other stuff in the cells of plants that makes it very hard. Some of us produce more cholesterol than others. And sometimes when it blocks and gets in these arteries and it gets too much, it blocks off those arteries like we talked about at the beginning of the presentation. Dietary foods, all foods from animals contain some form of cholesterol, meat, fish, eggs, milk, cheese, chicken. Some actually just have more than others. So choosing foods that have lower cholesterol and better profiles, as uh, David said, fish, chicken, healthier fish, like, you know, cod, you know, salmon, you know, tuna may be better than, say, for instance, catfish. Catfish tastes good. Some people like it, but just understand that certain fishes have more fatty content than, say, a whitening fish. Next slide. And so just real quickly, talk about these four lipoproteins. These lipo, these cholesterols are created on these proteins called lipid proteins, lipoproteins. The high-density ones are called HDLs. The low-density ones are called LDLs, and the very low-density ones are called VLDLs. These are very important because they're smaller, and they can get underneath blood vessels and clotted arteries even more aggressively than the bigger molecules. Triglycerides are a type of fat that's carried on these things called chylomicrons, but they're also important because this is where energy is stored. And so when the body needs it, it taps to these triglycerides that basically are our primary energy store. When we have too much of it, the rest of it is shunted into our cholesterol, and this is what gets blocked up in the total serum cholesterol and in the arteries. Next slide. So just understand that these molecules of fat in the bloodstream that result directly from our diet. Next slide. So when you eat that high uh, fat burger and drink that drink with sugar and eat this, the uh, ice cream afterwards with the apple pie, this gets basically blocked up into the arteries. Sometimes you have this kind of atypical chest discomfort when that occurs. Understand that this can be scavenged. It can be improved upon when you have high HDL in the body. This is a, a basically a level greater than 60 is considered to be protective. HDLs are your good guys. This can pick up your BLDL and your LDL or your bad cholesterol and transport it to the liver for destruction. The more HDL, the better. Next slide. And so as Walter would say, know your numbers. One of the best ways to reduce your LDL and positive impact your total serum cholesterol is to reduce the intake of animal food products, as Dave said. These foods are these are foods with higher levels of saturated fat and cholesterol. Next slide. And one of the best ways to increase your HDL again is to get regular aerobic exercise. Resistance training, stretch training, isometric exercise doesn't improve your cholesterol, but running, riding a bicycle, swimming. For not only 20 minutes, it works, it helps. But once you get your heart rate up into your target zone, continue it for 20 to 30 minutes. Once you've gotten your heart rate up, gives you the best chance to improve your internal physiology. Next slide. And just understand that as it relates to like cholesterol and fat, choosing vegetable oils, things that are oil at room temperature, palm or palm kernel or coconut oil tend to be thicker and heavier, but things like canola oil and olive oil actually are better as well as vegetable oil at, look, at improve your cholesterol profile. But when you're eating animal products, choose lighter uh, meats, take the skin off. Next slide. And using skim milk and low dairy, uh, low fat dairy products also help. Next slide. And just also remember reading a food label before you buy it, before you consume it. A food, just understand that is cholesterol free is not necessarily fat free. A food that is fat free, however, contains no cholesterol. So understand what it is when you're reading it and just understand the interrelation between this. Next slide. And so in closing, we want you to remember that reducing health risk factors such as cholesterol, high blood pressure, smoking, and body weight decrease your risk of developing and or dying prematurely from the dreaded chronic diseases associated with obesity 
and atherosclerosis, but it also prevents you from dying from things such as the COVID-19 if your body is optimized. Next slide. So we want, what can you do to reduce your health risk factors? The first thing again is to educate yourself outside of this virtual town hall, educate yourself, learn how to modify your lifestyle. It's not just measuring the numbers, it's what you do with this information. That's your personal responsibility to take the best care of yourself and your family that you can. So getting regular exercise, 90 to 150 minutes, 200, 300 minutes, the more the better to a point where you're not hurting yourself. Eating a healthy, balanced diet each day, beginning a program of consistent physiologic self-monitoring and self-management. If you can't eat well and healthy, consistent, which most Americans can't just because of our lifestyle, then supplementation does help, but high quality supplements work better. Last slide. And then optimizing your immune health. We have, over the course of this pandemic as an organization, done well. Members have been surviving and thriving because we have focused on our immune health and preventative maintenance using vitamin D, using zinc, using multivitamin turmeric. This is just to show you and share with you. This is our regimen. It's endorsed by the 100 Black Men of America, and we've been very successful using it. So last slide. I just want to thank each and every one of you. If you have additional questions, please drop them in the chat. Uh, and I just want to just thank each and every one. You've been a great audience. And I just want to say thank you to the panelists. Thank you, Dr. Grizz. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Walter, for being an outstanding moderator. So while they're doing this, Walter, right. if we sure. can, I'd like to just kind of just acknowledge a few of our uh, supporters okay. and sponsors. And I'm going to transition it over to you, if that's OK. Sure. Go ahead, man. OK, excellent. And so next slide. There's a question. Dr. Okay. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Sure. Go, go back yeah. to you. Yeah, about, about weightlifting versus aerobic exercise and what's your take on that? Okay. Well, no, I think that's a, a great question. And, and so when you think about strength training versus aerobic exercise, strength training is to build muscle. Building muscle increases your metabolism. Increasing your metabolism when you exercise, helps you to burn off more energy when you engage in regular aerobic exercise, what we call regular exercise. Aerobic exercise causes your heart to beat faster. It causes the heart muscle to become stronger and more efficient. So the aerobic exercise to improve your cardiovascular strength is one way of looking at it. it improves the flow of blood through the body into the brain. That's why you can think better after exercising. But resistance training is to build those muscles up by having more muscle mass and less fat mass. Then your body actually has a higher metabolism so that even with that higher energy consumption and more food consumption, it right. actually will burn off more food. So you can be trim and slim like you, like Walter, because mm -hmm. you guys are athletes. Right. And so just understanding that even flexology and stretching is a form of exercise. Guys, some, uh, a final close out. Go ahead, Dr. Dan, and close us out with this. Okay, well, great. So thank you, Walter. So again, if you want more information, we encourage you to please visit our 100 Black Men of America health site to learn more about Healthcare 2.0. If you type in Healthcare 2.0, or 100blackmen.org, Healthcare 2.0, you can review the initiative and even enroll the app the technology to basically monitor, self-monitor has been provided by Eagle Force. So click on basically the personal or provide enrollment link to download this Mimi RX app and get started with the persistent biometric self-monitoring program today. This is also a digital personal health record. So when you go to the doctor, you can even start one for your parents and you need that information, the medications and what were they on, this can be stored in one place on these smart devices. So it's really a convenience factor as well as an immunization record. This, okay. this device will help you to know which vaccine you got, whether you got a Pfizer vaccine or a Moderna. We're not at the point where we know mixing is safe. Okay. So you want to know which one you got the last time. And so, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Danner. Uh, again, um, you know, on behalf of the 100 Black Men of America and on behalf of Radio One and Dr. Danner, Dr. Alexandra, and Tommy Deutsch, our chairman. Well, grateful. go ahead. Before I do this, I just wanted to share people, share with you this one thing. And uh, again, I'm going to turn this over. But there are these devices that are readily available to each and every one of you. They okay. can be obtained through iHealth, through Amazon, through Walgreens, through Apple, and even Fitbit. 
but you can begin your own program today. Mm -hmm. And just understand that these things have to be ran on platforms with this iHealth platform, right. Mimi Lux, MyVax. Next slide. And there's two more slides I want to share. That okay. Brian, I want to thank again the National COVID Resiliency Network. There's a plethora of information that's there for you on COVID-19 in every state. Hit resources. This is a HHS. Office of Minority Health Sponsored Grant to make sure that everybody can get this information. So we want to thank them. You also at Danbar for Life, my uh, website, there's information that Dave talked about on this matter and things like that and nutrition. Okay. Just understand that these things are available to you. Next slide. Keep moving. And again, we want to thank special thanks to our, our sponsors, Pfizer, the Pfizer Foundation, Morehouse, and NCRN. But we want to thank the listening audience for your support and participation in our 100 Black Men of America Healthcare 2.0 Virtual Town Hall Series. Next slide. But last, we want to give a special thanks to Urban One, Radio One, for being wonderful hosts for this event. We want to thank Miss Kathy Hughes. I know she's not interacting with us directly. Chairperson, the founder for Radio One for Urban One. And we want to thank the senior account manager, senior uh, director, uh, Dwayne Whitaker, and the senior account manager, senior executive account manager, Andre Tillman, for putting this together. It's really has been awesome. And I want to thank, lastly, next slide. I want to thank, uh, again, next slide, uh, Walter Kirkland, who's been an outstanding moderator. He's a TV personality. You think mm -hmm. he just, uh, <laughs> lucky. He's actually good. So I just want to give you kudos. <laughs> thank you once again. I'm thank you, sir. You, but thank you, everybody. Wow, what a great presentation. Let's give uh, Dr. Dan a round of applause, panelists. Uh, that was just phenomenal. Um, as we close out this, uh, this has been a journey. And we're not going to rush this, Dr. Dan. We're going to take our time. I know we're at the bottom of the hour. Again, I want to thank you for your leadership and thank Dr. Alexander as we try to put our arms around health. And, you know, I don't know what you think, Dave, but when I go to my doctor, who most most times are majorities or white doctors, they they look at us a little differently in terms of how they give responses in terms of when should we get a colon screening? When should we uh, get a prostate exam? I just think they don't quite understand us, David. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to go around Robin and I we got to open this up a little bit, you know, as Dr. Dan and I say, barbershop talk, because it's great to present. But now we got to have the conversation. And uh, so we're not going to rush this off. So, you know, it's been a year. And let's just start with you, David. It's been a year with when COVID-19 uh, hit us. And oh, my God, we lost over what, close to 600,000 people. It really hit us, David, uh, three times full in terms of the African-American community. Yep. Where do we go from here, David? Well, I think, you know, it's very clear to me and to Dr. Dana, and I think Dr. Griggs and yourself that we have to maintain our focus. We cannot just uh, deviate because viruses are out there. They come around each year. We have to protect ourselves. So as Dr. Griggs says, wear your mask, socially distance, um, wash your hands, do all those things, even if you're vaccinated or if you're not. But it's important that we focus on our nutrition and our health. Do the things that we share because these are fundamental things that were relevant prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, will be relevant post-COVID, uh, that you've got to get your foundation right. Start at the foundation, get yep. your health right, the nutrition, all this stuff. Get your rest. Your sleep is important. Mm -hmm. Exercise. You know, all these things tie together in a, what I call the 360 degree yes. health and wellness optimization. Thank you, David. I know Dr. Griggs, you're on vacation with your lovely wife. You have a hard stop. Dr. Griggs, the same question, please. A year yeah, later. So, so the thing I would advise is that you treat your body as though it were an army because we are at war. Uh, we're at war with a virus and it's the first time in our species and the whole world is suffering. You would make sure that your troops are well fed. You would make sure that your troops were all vaccinated. That You'd make sure that your troops had all the tools in their bag in order to be able to, to fight. You'd make sure that your troops had enough water. You'd make sure that your troops had enough off times and furlough days to, stay, to, to be relaxed enough when they're on the battlefield and not be distracted by stress. So treat yourself well, get your shot, wear your mask, get checked, get fit, get moving. Thank Dr. You. Griggs, thank you. I know you have to go meet your wife. Thank you for your participation, your leadership. And we're going to look out more for your animated series. So that was pretty hot. <laughs> right. Thanks a lot. 
All right, so the other guys can hang out. See you later. Um, yeah, so Dr. Danner, I know we had uh, some a lot of details in this journey. We got a year later, Dr. Danner. We started this journey about a year and a half ago, and we're here. We've had persistent monitoring. We had devices. We've had blood pressure cuffs, which, by the way, Dr. Danner will agree, I want all of you listening right now, watching to get you a blood cuff device. And I want you to measure your blood pressure once a week, if not a couple times a week, and get a baseline. We have rushed brothers to the emergency room with high blood pressure to the point they didn't know they had blood pressure. So I'd like you on behalf of the 100 Black Men of America to invest into these devices here. This is a contactless thermometer. This is a blood pressure. They're really cheap on Amazon. You can go to iHealth.com. And then lastly, this is a pulse ox. Pulse ox measures the oxidization in your lungs in terms of in terms of if you have COVID or if you're sick. So get these three things on Amazon. Dr. Uh, Danner, your thoughts on a year later? Where, where are we, Dr. Danner? Where do we go? No, I, I think that what you said is very awesome. And I want to just add to there's actually even a scale. Making sure that you're keeping track of your weight is important. What I've learned through this pandemic and what people have impressed me with is how they rallied and they grasped and embraced technology and that how much you could really do outside of the realm of the healthcare industrial complex. You have the capability, you have the technology, now you have to have the political and the personal will to do something. I am a believer in America, I'm a believer in people, and I believe in you, and I know that you can do these things. This is why we want to share this information, and we know that when we come out of this pandemic, the thing that I realized is we're going to come out better. We've learned things, even the financial institutions of America, education's changed. And this is the biggest thing. And I can tell you right now, Walter, we're not going back. So everybody's looking forward to, okay, the way we used to do business, short yes, your doctors, what was my blood pressure, what was my cholesterol last year? That mentality has to be changed. You have to own your health. You have to know your numbers. You have to measure them, monitor them. You have to assess those numbers. And then you have to make healthy lifestyle changes. It's no more and are no longer acceptable to basically show up at the doctor's office ill-informed. The difference between a customer and a client, Walter, Dave, mm -hmm. is a customer doesn't have product knowledge. A client has extensive knowledge. So you have to have a totally different discussion. Yes. I wish my friend Charles Latham was on and basically start talking to him, basically they would take his brother off of his uh, cholesterol medicine. Charles was like, well, what's the lipid panel show? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, oh, you don't have one. Well, maybe you need to continue this. And, and then all of a sudden they're writing a prescription and starting that back and ordering that lipid panel. You have to know your bill of rights. So, so Dr. Danner, this is, I got an epiphany. You're saying if you're more educated when you're actually getting, you know, with your doctor, you'll get more respected and you'll get a better response. Is that what you're saying by being more informed? Absolutely. Wow. Our, basically our patients, our informed patient, it turns into a dialogue. We love having informed patients. We talk about health disparities and health yeah. equity. Maybe it's an educational equity issue, not just literacy, mm. but maybe educational empowerment. So we got the technology and the devices. Now we're teaching people how to use them. But yeah, if you show up and you don't know anything, there's a book out of Harvard. Basically, it says, how doctors think. And Walter says, how long does a doctor see you before he makes this clinical decision? Out of Harvard, that book says 18 seconds. So if you come in uninformed, 18 seconds. You know what, Dr. Dana, this is profound. And I want to get your comments, David. Um, there's a lot more respect that happens when you're more informed because I have found it's a number, David. David, they get you in, get you out. Matter of fact, th they were taking my blood pressure, David, while I was moving. I was like, time out, time out. You're not, gonna, you're not doing this, David. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to relax for three minutes because as you know, Dr. Danner, you need three uh, blood pressure measurements because what happens is you got it honestly, and I don't care if it's a pay for whatever they're trying to do, it's not an accurate reading, David. I mean, that's why the blood pressure is not, it's erratic. That's a baseline for your health. Can you comment on that, David? Yes, there's white coat syndrome. People <laughs> walk in and they look at the doctor and they see Dr. Danner with his white coat on and they're like, yeah. oh no, and the blood pressure spikes, right? So you have to be clear. You, Walter, you said it. It's not an exact machine. It, it has standard yeah. deviation and the changes in the pressure within the vessels, the, the arteries and the veins, right? So you have to be, um, as Dr. Dennis said, you give 
a doctor a lot of information about your parents, your grandparents, and your family history, and you give them about what's been happening to you, they can make more of an informed decision. But when you limit the amount of information you provide them with, they're just going to be trial and error. They don't know. So it's very important, Walter, what you're saying here is got to share information. But again, you got to get educated on panels like this, provide you with real, yes, you know, the truth, the information. And once you have this kind of information on a regular basis, you can make better decisions for yourself and your families. Yeah, I think we got to do more of these, Dr. Dan. And we're getting a lot of comments. Thank you, Carl Tutt out of uh, Chi-Town uh, for your, your feedback. Real men making a difference. And I think what we, we want to do in our next phase, Dr. Danner, is barbershop talk. This is what we're doing right now. You know, it's great to have the clinical piece. It's great yeah. to talk about stats and data. But this real talk uh, conversation is what we need more of, David and Dr. Danner, because I think Black folks are struggling for information. And, you know, and I want to ask Dr. Danner on this as we digress. Uh, why, why the hesitancy, uh, Dr. Danner, of Black folks and other uh, minorities to get vaccinated, even where we are now? There's still some lack of, is it just ignorance? Is it just knowledge? What's going on, Dr. Danner? I, I think that, you know, with the information age, I think that people are relabeling and mislabeling it. But in the information age, people have access to tons of information. And so it's information overload. And, you know, we have to take into account, you know, the history of America and the history of Western civilization and not disrespect people who know history and who have an understanding of the things that have happened. And so you have to handle them differently. The Tuskegee uh, syphilis right. is yeah. a real experience. The other things, you know, some of the testing sites, like things going on, like in Oakland, California, these are real experience. There were people mm -hmm. who were tested for a variety of different drugs in the military that, you know, again, LST, those things came from scientific experiences. So my thing is to each and every one of you, become informed. Understand that in order to get out of the pandemic, the way we're going to do this is together. That teamwork really does make the dream work. But what you can't do is minimize your belief or basically trying to downplay your understanding. The way to do it is to answer those questions, the tough questions. Are there risks associated with taking these vaccines? Absolutely. There's a CDC website, the Vaccine Associated or Adverse Event Reporting System. These things are reported. If you take Tylenol, can you have liver failure? If you take ibuprofen, can you have renal failure? If you drink too much water, can you have polydipsia or can you have hyponatremia? You absolutely can. There's risk associated with everything we do. But you got to understand getting COVID-19 and not actually having an optimal immune system or whatever actually protects you and why some people live and some people die, we don't know. What we do know in real body counts in these body bags, they're real humans. 587,000 now approaching 600 people that are dying and the risk of dying from the coronavirus seems to be a lot higher than it does from getting the vaccines. So we have to think in the short term and also in the long term. So I think the key is education, answering those questions and being honest and straightforward. There has to be a level of transparency so that nobody feels like anybody's trying to get one up on them. I do think that all of them have their merit. I'm not a salesperson of vaccine. So I think right. that educating yourself and making the best decision as it relates to you. There was a question in the chat that somebody was asking about mercury and salmon yeah. and basically in foods. Some foods you get come from areas where there are higher contents of substances, even mercury that's in there. Some people will say that the Atlantic salmon has a higher mercury content than the Pacific salmon or the salmon up around from around Alaska. So just understand there may be differences, but yeah. these differences are small. If you eat in moderation and you're not eating the same Atlantic salmon in large 16 ounce quantity because it comes right. with these big slabs every meal because that's my favorite food. In moderation, the body has incredible resiliency. And so just understand that moderation is key. But mm -hmm. I also say knowledge is very powerful if you apply it. Hosea 4, 6, one of my favorite scriptures, it says, my people, our people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Yes. So understand these things. This is what we need to do as it relates to the vaccines as well. Right. And, and I think, 
And I think Dr. Danner and David, we got to have more of these panels because I don't know about you. I like hearing from people that look like me. Uh, Dr. Gupta is fine, you know, but I love hearing from people that look like me because it just gets real informed. These comments are off the charts. So as we close this out, um, which has been an amazing series, Dr. Danner, for like the last year, we've had four or five of these and we'll continue to do more of these. Let's just, uh, I want you guys to have some final comments, David. So what's your final comments as it relates to health, as it relates to COVID-19 in this discussion tonight? And I want you to shout out your company again, your website, because um, you know, you're know you doing a great job, David, with your health and your family. So just close this out in this final segment. What's your final thoughts? All right, so thanks, Walter. Um, my final thoughts, really, I hope the audience came away with some very valuable information from Walter, from Dr. Griggs, from Dr. Daner, and uh, myself today, and we'll continue to share. And that's what I, I like doing is sharing and providing the truth and following the science and information that's there. So I think it's important for everybody to stay vigilant. Uh, you cannot let your guard down. You have to continue to wear your mask when you get into places where you, you, know, you see the dynamics, you're indoors, you, you have to protect yourself and you're protecting others. Uh, we know that the, the issues around history and the things that have been done to people of color, it's real. Um, you know, I was on a call with uh, um, my folks in the, folks in, the, um, in the corporate world talking about, you know, the George Floyd and all the issues and things that are continue to happen in our country. But guess what? You again have to look at the facts and look at the detail, do your homework and uh, before you move forward. So protect yourself, protect your family. And uh, each decision is the individual's decision. It's your decision, how you want to take care of your life, how you want to mitigate the risk that Dr. Daner talked about and Dr. Griggs on the session um, and do something about it. Take action now, stay healthy, get healthy and change the bad habits. Outstanding. Uh, Dr. Danner, can you close this out with your final comments? Yeah, and I will. And I, I want to address one uh, question uh, from Paul Lindsay. And his question was, can uh, we talk about the vaccine and the connection to the amount of antibodies we need to be safe? And the answer is, you know, we really don't know the answer. As he talked about, how many particles do you need to get, to get infected? What we do know is that when you have an infection, the body makes antibiotics to this infection, and then it makes memory cells, the B cells. Whether you need antibodies floating around constantly or not, I don't know if that's actually true. It's just whether or not you're using that serum to treat somebody. But when you get that infection and you have memory, then the body can mobilize cells to produce antibodies really quickly. So having a healthy and intact immune system is important, not only to respond to it initially, but then to adapt to it so that now you have a very directed way of approaching the contagion, whether it's the coronavirus or it's streptococcus pneumonia or, or staph infection. However, a vitamin D level over 30 is not to actually just fight off the infection. It's actually to turn your immune response off. A lot of people die. It seems like they had the cytokine storm and the body attacked itself. That is called a hyperinflammatory state. You do not want a hyperinflammatory state. Turmeric, some of these other agents could come that was mentioned. Somebody asked about flaxseed or chia oil, chia seeds. Why does this work? Even uh, the, the other substance, it's called the antioxidants. Not only does the biophotonic scanner measure the carotenoid score, it also measures antioxidant levels. Antioxidants are free radical scavengers that basically take these little bullets, these oxygen-free radicals that damage things, and it absorbs them up. When you have an infection, this side of the body basically destroys things. When you, don't have, when you clear the infection, it can destroy itself. And this is what we call autoimmune conditions. So just understanding higher vitamin D levels are associated with lower autoimmune conditions and your body fighting itself. So okay. preventative maintenance is after you wear your mask, do all this primary prevention, secondary prevention is where we need to be at. When preventative maintenance and secondary prevention fails, that's when we need to start worrying about therapeutics. There are other drugs that are out there, things even that may not be mentioned off-label, like artemin and ivermectin, that may actually have some merit. There are other drugs that we use in the hospital, steroids, dexamethasone, remdesivir, that may have some efficacy. But trying to keep yourself from getting sick enough to needing these kind of medications that you have to go and guess, is it safe? That is really the goal. That should be the spirit. So don't drop your guard. Don't go get an infection and see if you're tough enough 
to ha handle the corona. Personally, Walter, I'm going to end with this. I'm not willing, and I don't want to date Rona. Rona <laughs> not for me. All right, well, what an amazing, <laughs> amazing journey. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Danner, you just, you, you always bring the heat, man. So I want to thank you. Again, thanks, Radio One, Kathy Hughes. For more information, go to 100 uh, blackmen.org, 100 blackmen.org slash healthcare 2.0, 100 blackmen.org slash healthcare 2.0. Stay tuned, more to come. Be safe, wear a mask, wash your hands. And we want to say thank you so much. Dr. Dan, you have something else you want to say? And on the Urban One Radio One website, this uh, broadcast should be available through the Radio One. Yes. Uh, so if you have friends and others who you think may benefit from this, Go sure. to either our website or to Radio One, uh, Urban One, and basically you'll be able to see this uh, broadcast again in the other virtual town halls. Thank you once again, Walter. Thank you, yes. Pfizer, and thank you, NCRN, and everybody who supported us. Yeah, and, 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 uh, and, and, and then one last shout out again. I know we're doing only shout outs to Stanley Campbell for Eagle Force yeah. With, yeah. You know, with his devices and monitoring. He's the one that brought us all together. So thank you, Peter. And God, I, I want everyone. to say, Walter, I want to make one more shout out to Kukua, yeah. Kukua Fitness. I think uh, a lot of folks need to get on board, okay. do that African dance. Um, okay. Dr. Dana watched me and my wife and a bunch of friends yeah. do it. It's good. It's great exercise, great cardio. And then Love How You Age is really our website, but you know it's under construction. We'll be yeah. launching it in a couple of weeks. Uh, but yeah. uh, my wife and I into the health and wellness business, and we have a lot more information to share. And hopefully we'll get a leader like Walter to lead us down this path continuously so we can provide good education to our constituents. Yeah, and then one last every, one last thing, people. You got all this information now. Now to Dr. Danner's perspective, you gotta apply it. You gotta get the devices. You gotta monitor yourself. You gotta know your numbers. You gotta follow some of the things that David indicated with nutrition. So it's great to give you information, but now you have to apply it. So you can, you can, you can bring that big horse to the water, but you can't make him the drink, right? So drink the water, drink the Kool-Aid, God bless you. This is Walt Kirkland. We appreciate you. Be safe out there. Bye for now. All right. We'll, thank we'll, you. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.